very warm welcome to everyone joining us on our webinar today. We are so excited to have you, especially for this webinar. We're really excited because we've got lots of live demos that we can't wait to show you. Uh, we're doing a kicking off a webinar series, actually, and we're going to be demystifying Wi-Fi. And in this one today, we're going to be covering coverage planning, and we're going to show you how you can make it simple. So this webinar today is purely focusing on how we do coverage planning in multiple different types of environments. And if you're wondering who's on the show today, well, you've got myself, my lovely Mac, and your favorite psychic Stu. And um, yeah, we're very excited to get the webinar going. So Mac, take it away, my friend. Of course, of course. Coffee at 5.02 p.m. That will make me sleep way better at night. So we'll be talking about coverage today. There are two different coverages, or even more if you need more, but we are covering our premises with a primary coverage first. This is like a very basic Wi-Fi requirement. With no coverage, there is absolutely no Wi-Fi. So it doesn't matter if you are designing for a hotel, a warehouse, carpeted office space, or anything else, you need to have primary coverage there. Otherwise, there is no Wi-Fi. And then we have a primary, a secondary coverage, sorry. And secondary coverage is the Wi-Fi coverage from the second best access point. And we need to have secondary coverage for multiple different reasons. More, most important ones are roaming and redundancy. Roaming is very important because when you're associated to your primary best AP currently, and then you start moving away from that AP, you always, always want to have a secondary coverage ready for you to roam to with a very decent signal strength. And redundancy, when you lose the primary AP, what happens? You still want to be connected to Wi-Fi in typical, in most cases. So you want to have multiple APs covering the same space for redundancy reasons as well. Exactly. And also we're going to be talking about some environments where, you know, it's going to be crucial. Obviously we need the primary coverage, but there's going to be some environments we're going to show you that maybe having secondary coverage isn't as crucial. So we can't wait to show you that in a little while time as well. Before we get into talking about coverage planning, we wanted to really highlight one of our uh, steps from our three steps to great Wi-Fi every day. And the first step is that, you know, to do a great wireless network, you need to gather requirements because it's really important that you find out exactly what it is you need to design the Wi-Fi for and you document these requirements as well. It's really key because if you do not document what your customer or whoever you're designing the Wi-Fi for, they, um, I don't know if this happened to you before, but it certainly happened to me is that you uh, start designing based on what you believe that, you know, you've agreed what the requirements are. And all of a sudden, as you get into the implementation phase, they go, oh, by the way, Matt, actually now I kind of want it to do this instead of that. And you're like, well, that's quite a bit of a change. So documenting requirements uh, is really good practice. So you don't ever have the, the goalpost shifting on you. And the reason why it's great to document the requirements and gather the requirements from your customer or whoever it is you're designing the Wi-Fi for is so that you can get the right number of access points that you need, making sure you put them in the right locations and also get in the configuration of your access points right as well. So what we're going to be focusing on for this webinar is around coverage planning. And with step one, we're going to be focusing on the primary coverage as well as secondary coverage. Okay, so let's take a look at our three steps to great Wi-Fi. This is the, the steps that we are using to maintain and design and validate Wi-Fi. That's a Wi-Fi life cycle. So today we are focusing on step one, as Matt has already covered. And in order to get a good coverage, you really need to understand the technicalities of your site, the attenuation of your walls, the building materials used on site that you want to cover. So before you even start doing a simulation using Ekahau, ideally you want to go to the site to not only understand the existing RF, the DFS condition, or the preferences when it comes to where to mount APs and antennas, but most importantly, from coverage perspective, you want to understand the attenuation of walls and other building materials. You do that on site as part of the Wi-Fi design survey. And then you use all this information that you've gathered on site, you feed it into Ekahau, making sure that you create a fantastic, accurate, and reliable Wi Fi design. 
<clears throat> so we have got some few of the common wall materials that you may find on site, which will, when we show you for the first time today, uh, Ekahal Pro, is that we have got some defined wall type materials in there that have got some typical attenuation values. So for example, let's say like a drywall, in our experience, we have found that this is normally around like a 3 dB attenuation loss. But what Max said about, you know, the step one, making sure you go on site, you gather uh, this information, do your attenuation testing is because sometimes drywall won't be 3 dBs. Sometimes there could be something in between that drywall, or you could have drywall drop that next to another drywall. Or sometimes we've even seen where it goes drywall and then brick wall and then drywall. So it's really, really important that we understand what these different values are for when we're doing our predictive model inside of Eckhal, because getting the attenuation values of the walls incorrect can really impact your design and the accuracy of your uh, imp implementation once it, it gets installed. So we've got a few common values here. So drywall, like we said, 3DBs. We've also got brick and some concrete, some very common materials that we find on site. And glass is also quite common. And also when you get your design wrong because of wrongly measured attenuation and not accurate 3D model of the building you are using to do your simulation, you lose your credibility as well. So we are not only designing based on a free space pathless in Ekehau. We want to really understand what devices we are designing for. And before we can do it, we have to, to get that device and understand its capabilities and understand how sensitive is it? Uh, what generation it supports? How many spatial streams it has? What channels it supports and doesn't support? So basically we want to identify something that we call LCMI, least capable, most important device and design for that device. So LCMI typically, it is not as good quality from the sensitivity perspective as a Sidekick is, for example. So when you see something with a Sidekick ad, let's say next 67, your least capable, most important device might be seeing your RSSI in the same spot next to the sidekick with something considerably less. And that will, that will lead to different designs. So you need to absolutely understand capabilities and sensitivity of devices that you are designing for. And it's funny, depending on what environment you're designing the Wi-Fi for, you'll find there's a whole variation of what is classified as the uh, least capable, most important device. Sometimes if you're doing an enterprise office, you might find the person that you're working with will say, hey, the CEO, they've got this really old laptop that they just love and they never want to throw it away, but it's not been upgraded for a few years and it doesn't work too well on the Wi-Fi, but this is the most important device. If this device doesn't work on the Wi-Fi after this new design, you're going to be getting complaints about it. So we have to ensure, you know, everywhere this device goes it works really really well whereas if you're designing for a warehouse environment what could be de defined as the least capable but the most important device are those barcode scanners that they invested in like 10 years ago and they haven't been upgraded because they they still work okay but now they want new wi-fi well these barcode scanners is how they run their business and they scan all of the stock all of the inventory and if they don't work on the Wi-Fi, then the business doesn't run. So this is now your least capable, most important device. So making sure you understand what these devices are, what their capabilities are, but also most importantly, making sure you document them, going back to step one, gathering those requirements, documenting them. So you know what you are designing the Wi-Fi to meet requirements wise, but also for what type of devices is really key and crucial. It is indeed. And in the enterprise environment, you actually might be designing for your smartphones, even if it's super capable flagship Android or flagship iOS device, it might still be your LCMI. Okie doke. So let's start a poll and let your favorite poll read the poll. So I'm launching it now. And the question is, what is your biggest challenge when it comes to coverage planning? Answer A, meeting primary coverage requirements. B, meeting secondary coverage requirements, C, mounting restrictions, or D, co-channel interference, aka channel contention. Interesting to see what the results are for this poll today, Mac. First of all, Stu, please enlighten us. What would you have come from? Uh, I would have said depends, but um, no. <laughs> I'm actually going to say, um, I'm actually going to say is um, 
uh, some of the biggest challenges when it comes to coverage planning is is going to be meeting um, the requirements. And and I do see that there's you know things with co-channel and mounting, but I'm I'm actually you know those challenges are is meeting the requirements because it's going to also depend on uh, everything else in that that uh, those questions like mounting restrictions, right? Those are going to mm. play into that, that primary coverage requirements. So th that's where I stand on that one. Okay, how about you, Matt? What do you think? Oh, that is a really, it's a really good question. And actually, um, secondary coverage can be challenging sometimes. And I uh, don't want to give too much away before we get to the live demos, but I think we might be showing you why secondary coverage sometimes can be an issue. And, you know, you think you've met the requirements for your primary coverage, but, oh no, you check and your secondary coverage requirements are not met as well. You need to go and re-tinker and play with your design. So, right. um, yeah. yeah. Mac, what about you then? What would you have gone for? For me, mounting restrictions, 100%. So how many times have you been in a situation where you went to the site and you see, oh, I want to place an access point here, there, 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 and there, and there. Then you come back home, you create a beautiful design. You are so proud of your work. It was like a listed building and very difficult one with thick walls and thin walls and some glass. And then you give it to the customer saying, oh, this is the draft of the design, 200 APs. Took me a while, but it's fantastic. And then they come back to you saying, oh, out of this 200 APs, you can't mount 189 because of the ceiling is restricted, because you can't touch the ceiling, you can't touch the wall. And yeah, it might be a little bit challenging. So mounting restrictions for me. Fair enough, good to know. But yeah, we, we definitely came across that once or once or twice in our journeys throughout our prof Wi-Fi professional services career. <clears throat> okay, um, well, we wanted to talk about something else now. And sometimes meeting your coverage requirements that means you sometimes need to think slightly out of the box and not just go with the integrated omnidirectional access points, but actually using access points that support external antennas. And what we've got here is three different types of uh, antennas. And the first one that we're showing you is a uh, external omnidirectional antenna that's sometimes referred to as like a dipole or a rubber duck type of antenna. And when would this be a good use case for you to use in, in your environment? Well. External antenna APs are generally more ruggedized. So if you're in a bit more of a challenging environment where the uh, environment might be a little bit harsher, then this could be a good use case for when you might want to use this type of access point. Also, if you're doing an environment where you don't want to mount the AP all the way up on the ceiling because it's too high up for an omnidirectional access point, but you do want to use an omni directional pattern to AP or antenna, what you could do is actually install the AP on a wall, like a clock, and then repolarize the dipole antennas. So they're like two pointing up, two pointing down. And then this way, it will keep the correct propagation pattern for your omnidirectional external antennas. I was gonna say, if, if Stu says something and then moves his head slightly to the left or to the right, We've got a very good example of that, actually, just behind him, where you, if you look closely, I'll let him talk, but you will see there is an access point with these types of antennas above his head. Absolutely, yeah. So that, those are kind of the uh, the dipole, and of course I have them in a package here ready to go for show and tell. That is kind yeah, of the dipole, right? right? So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, okay. yes. Or or the small uh, monotype, which is in a similar type of the, these omnidirectional antennas, but offer a different type of down tilt as compared to the top of one right so that helps in the design. yes and also typically these dipole antennas they cover more than internal built-in omnis also internal built-in omnis they don't cover just around like a donut shape they cover slightly down and around so depending on what you need you will you will use different antennas also the even omnidirectional antennas they can have different gain and what that means is that they will direct the energy differently around the antenna so if you have low gain antenna, there will be like a sphere, like a balloon, like a circular thing. When you have higher gain omnidirectional antenna, then you will get like flatter and flatter, flatter shape. So it will be covering more around and less towards the ceiling and towards the floor. Alrighty, so that was omnidirectional antennas. Now we can also use semi-directional or more directional antennas, external ones or internal ones. And there are several different use cases to use these antennas. Like when you think about semi-directional like six, seven, eight DBI gain antennas, this means that in front of an antenna, typically looking like 
like that, like a patch antenna or sector antenna, they're like quite thin and they are quite rectangular or square and they are propagating in front of those antennas. And if you don't have too much gain, like six, seven, eight dBi, and beam width is quite narrow, but not too narrow, like 60, 70, 80, 100, 120 degrees. This is what we see in the middle. And you will use these antennas to better reuse the spectrum. This is one use case, better use the spectrum to get more capacity that we will talk about in future webinars, or to direct the coverage better, closer to your, to your uh, devices, uh, to reduce your channel contention. Where would you use that? You would use that in, sim in different environments. Let's say in a warehouse, when you have a mezzanine floor and you don't know if you should use omnidirectional against the ceiling or a patch antenna pointing down. Typically the patch antenna, medium gain antenna pointing down will create a cone of coverage that will cover less around and focus more energy where the clients are, around pallets perhaps, or in the carpeted office space or high density areas. You would use more radios, more access points with these semi-directional antennas suspended down on a conduit bracket, creating this cones of coverage, and then you will be able to pack more radios, more APs in, a, in the same space. Because with Omnis, you can only pack as many. If you need to have more, then you need to start using directionals and suspend them down, creating cones of coverages. And the higher gain antennas, like 13 dBi, the last one on the screen, the great use case is a stadium or shooting in between the racks in the warehouse to light up an aisle. Or you can even have antennas that are quite directional, like you probably have seen a few weeks ago from Axel Techs, antennas that you mount in the, on the ceiling and they are lighting up the aisle from both sides, like both sides of the rack of the aisle is lit up from the antenna being mounted in the middle. Sometimes we'll mount them on both sides of the, of the aisles or one side of the aisle, depending on the requirements. If you need to have primary or primary and secondary coverage, or are you designing for redundancy on the AP level or not? So cover what you want while not covering what you don't want and cover your coverage where your users are by using correct type of antennas. So many different things to think about. Well, the good news is, is we're now going to start with our live demos and we've got a series of live demos where we're going to be showing you how you can do different types of coverage planning for different types of environments so let's take a look at our beautiful echohal pro now if this is the first time that you have seen echohal pro let me just cover a few of the basic things that we've done before we start showing you some of the coverage planning so the real key things that you need to do when you fire up Echohal Pro and you import a floor plan into Echohal, the first thing that you have to do is to scale the floor plan. And scaling the floor plan accurately is one of the key, if not the most key things that you need to do right. Um, so we have done that. The other thing that we have also done on this floor plan to save time and throughout the rest of the demos is we've already drawn the walls. And you can see them there. If I just turn off this area view for now, you'll see them in there nice pretty colors around the floor plan. So the different colors represent the different types of wall types that we have used, a mixture of concrete, con concrete drywall, or sheetrock, however you refer to it, and the uh, exterior windows plus interior windows. That's the reason why we've got different types of uh, wall colors there. The other thing that I just switched off that you could see is what we refer to in ECHO as an area. Now, this is where we have predefined an area for where we wanna see our coverage. So we can see that on the floor plan right now, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the view and I'm going to switch it off. So even though I turn it off from the view, it's still there in the background, but this enables us to be able to see what we're going to be doing on the floor plan a little bit easier. Uh, the other thing that we've got is something that's called exclusion areas. And exclusion areas are basically where we say, tell Echohal, like, hey, Echohal, uh, I don't care about having Wi-Fi in there. So it's not going to do any of the mathematic calculations or show you anything inside of those areas. Cool. So now we've got the basics covered. <clears throat> You might see up there on the floor plan, it says this is actually the Echohal Helsinki office. And before the webinar, we spoke to some of the fine ladies and gentlemen over in the Helsinki office, and they said, Matt, Mac, you know, I'd love it if you guys could help us with our Wi-Fi in the office. And we said, no problem. We can do a fabulous design for you live on a webinar with lots of amazing uh, guests watching us. So no pressure, but I'm sure between us all now, we can come up with a really nice coverage design for the Helsinki office. So if I want to start placing simulated access points on the floor plan now to get that 
uh, predictive coverage from the access point. What I need to do is come to Echo Pro, come underneath this planning tab, and then come across to this AP icon here. This is the simulated access point. And um, when I click on that, you'll see now that I get a drop down menu option here. And if I want to, what I can do, I can scroll down and find and select the access point or antenna that I want to use. But it might take me a little while because we've got thousands and thousands and thousands of different types of access points and antennas. Alternatively, what I can do is I can type in the model of AP that I am looking for. There we go. When I place the AP now, you can see I have got my simulated coverage coming from this access point. So you can see now I placed one AP on the floor plan and I placed it down here now. And what we see is the green coverage. We can see by looking at this visualization legend on the bottom right hand corner, what you see is being the strong color green going to the lighter color like yellowy orange is minus 30 dBm moving across down to minus 67 dBm. So minus 30 dBm is pretty much the strongest signal in Wi-Fi that you will see when you're out in the field. Also, neg 67 dBm. Now, this is going to be the cutoff of the cutoff where we want to see our primary cell edge. And then we've got a gray color. And what is that gray color? That is the signal between minus 67 to minus 85. And what is that representing? So this is almost what we class as our don't want area. And this don't want area is because it's now below our primary cell edge of neg 67 where we would have good Wi-Fi coverage and then going down to minus 85. Well, if we have another access point in the same area, sharing the same channel, and they can hear each other at minus 85 or greater, they share the Wi-Fi medium between each other um, because they have to be at neg 85 or stronger. If they're on a different channel or below that signal strength, then they would just be able to use the uh, RF medium more freely. So that's what we can see right now. So I can see placing this one Aruba AP down here in this part of the uh, office gives me some good coverage over here. But I need, now need to place some more access points. And I want to place one, maybe I want to place one up here in this office. And now I can see with two access points, I'm covering quite a lot of the office now. But maybe I need to place one more AP around here where this gray area is. Okay, three access points now. Looking, looking okay, I've got one more area in this top right hand corner that I need to, to take a look at. And if I now place my fourth access point up here, it now looks like I'm meeting my primary coverage requirements, no problem at all. Well, what frequency are we looking at right now? Well, if we come up here to where we can see the different types of options, we've got this visualization option here is showing us our primary signal strength for all of our access points that we've placed. And we are currently looking on the five gigahertz frequency band. If I change this to the 2.4, it shows me the 2.4 uh, coverage coming from the radios of these access points. But if I go back to five gigahertz, it shows me that here. So what do we think? Is this good, a good design for the guys and girls over in the Helsinki office or should we maybe check something else? Who are you asking? Um, I may. I it's, <laughs> it's better than expected from from your designs. Okay. But Thanks. how about that open space? I I, I, yeah. I think one of the things that's coming up really quickly here is um, uh, did they check the height? Did they check? <laughs> <laughs> of the, the did AP. I check the height? That's, that's a right. really good. That's a really good comment right? because yes. we were going to cover heights um, towards the back end of this live demo and to the start right, of the yeah. next part. But since it's been brought up, that's a very good point. So by default, what Echohel does when you place a simulated access point on the floor plan, it automatically puts the AP height at about two point four meters, or if you work in the other system feet, it's like seven point nine foot, I believe. I, I I live in the metric system. The other system uses. <sighs> So much so <laughs> apologies if you work in feet 2.4 meters which is a typical carpeted office height or 7.9 foot you can change this so let's say for example it wasn't 2.4 meter height in the helsinki office and i wanted to change the height of all of these access points i can absolutely do that and i can do that really easily so what i'm going to do is i pop out this left hand view on the left hand side and what you see now is this height so we see the height of the access points. They've all been placed at 2.4 meters. If you want to change from meters to feet, you go to Echo Pro 
preferences and then you change from the uh, length unit from meters to feet, I hit save, 7.9 foot. Okay, cool. I've got to go back to the metric system, sorry, because otherwise I will probably not get my uh, example right. But let's say that it's, they're not going to be mounted at 2.4 meters. They're going to be mounted at three meters height. And I want to change the height of all of these access points at one time. What I can do, if I go to actions, select all, actions, edit multiple access points. And what I can do now is I can change the height from 2.4 meters to three meters. And then and they are now being mounted at three meter height. So you, if you need to change the height of your access points, because it be higher or lower, you absolutely can. I'm just going to put them back to 2.4 and then continue on with the demonstration. So back to 2.4 okay. meters. And just, just before we close the demonstration, we've had several questions about the coverage requirements for uh, this office space. And when you look at the legend without even saying anything about it, you can see view as measured. And then we have the divider, aka how best practices. And also the legend shows next 67. So that's the primary signal strength that we are looking at now. Correct. So we are designing this office for to be ready for voice and video over Wi Fi. So to have a good Wi Fi working for voice and video over Wi-Fi, we need to have good primary coverage and we need to have good secondary coverage because our devices are going to be roaming throughout the office. They're going to be on their uh, mobile phone or they could be on their laptop connected to a video conferencing call and they're going to be answering it by the coffee machine and they'll be running around without their shoes on, by the way, to their back to their desks to sit down and continue with their call. So how do I see if I am meeting my primary coverage and my secondary coverage? Well, what I need to do is I now need to change from just looking at the signal strength view to the secondary signal strength view. And now straight away, what you can see, we're placing just four access points on this floor plan. It does not meet secondary coverage requirements. So going back to that poll question we had earlier where we were asking, you know, what can be a challenge for you when you're trying to do your coverage planning? Sometimes meeting the primary coverage can be fairly easy, but you need to think about secondary coverage as well. So how do we go about fixing the secondary coverage in the Helsinki office? Well, first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this simulated AP1 from here and put it inside of this boardroom. Because like Mac was saying earlier, we want to place access points and antennas as close to the users as possible and where they're going to be using the Wi-Fi. And from looking at the- I was saying that we have to direct the coverage where the users are. Antenna can be 20 meters away. If it's directional enough, it will be fine. Yeah, but in this example, where we're using integrated omnidirectional APs, we want to look at going to be where it's going to be like the busy areas and maybe where the Wi-Fi is going to be using slightly more demand and a uh, off a meeting room could, where you're going to have a congestion of users is potentially going to be an area where we want to make sure we've got good Wi-Fi. So I'm going to move this AP into here. And when I now place an additional access point, if I put it over into this room, what you will now see is that the secondary coverage requirements is now being met in this area. So with two access points here now, we are okay for our secondary coverage requirements. Oh, you can see we've still got some issues uh, in the top part of the office. So to make sure we've got good Wi-Fi at the Helsinki office, I think they might need it for what they're, they're working on. Let's place another couple of access points to make sure we can meet our secondary coverage requirements. So we've placed an AP over here. And I think we would probably add at least one more access point over here for where our users are. And now we can see looking at the five gigahertz, primary and secondary coverage is okay. And for the 2.4, primary and secondary is also okay. So we can quickly see by looking at this visualization now that our primary coverage and our secondary coverage requirements are being met. Mac, you look like you're dying to burst in and ask something there, go ahead. No, 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 no that's a okay. beautiful design. Thank you. Well, anyone in the Helsinki office, if you'd like a copy or want to use this design, by all means, you can. And we are fully aware that there's more to designing good Wi-Fi than just coverage planning. But in this episode today, we are focusing on how you design for coverage requirements purely for the whole webinar. And we're going to have a few more webinars over the next few series where we start to look at other requirements that we need to make sure we do to ensure we've got high performing wireless networks. So this was looking at the Helsinki office 
you're welcome everyone over there now for having some good Wi-Fi. Let's take a look at a different type of environment now. So I'm going to just drop in another pre-prepared file. And this time we're going to be looking at some uh, university dorm rooms. So again, we have already predefined all of our requirements. So we've got our scale, we've got our wall drawn, and we have got our areas configured. And we've got it all prepared for you. So some things to think about. I'm just going to turn off the areas again so we can see the uh, floor plan slightly uh, easier now. <clears throat> when we are designing for university dorm rooms, there's a few other things that we need to think about. So since there's going to be not necessarily as much of a requirement for users to be, you know, roaming around because they're going to be mainly in their dorm rooms using the Wi-Fi, um, we might not care as much about secondary coverage. So what I'm going to do now is, again, go to my planning tab. I'm down to the AP icon, select an access point to use. I'm going to grab this missed AP. But what I want to show you is actually something that we get asked quite a lot. And that's about where we place our access points and why we place them where we do. So what I want to do is I want to place this access point in the hallway. So I'm not sure if many of you place APs in hallways or you've heard of if you should or if you shouldn't place APs or in hallways and, and why that is. So if we take a look at the coverage from just this access point that we have placed in the hallway now. So what we can see where it's placed Right going into the rooms, there are some bathrooms with some additional walls that are going to be attenuating the Wi-Fi from this access point. Um, what you can see is that the Wi-Fi the wi from this AP in the hallway, it doesn't really provide great coverage actually into the rooms. And if you think about where the users will be using the Wi-Fi in these rooms, typically they have desks up against the window, and that's where they're going to be placing their laptop trying to use the Wi-Fi. So for the AP, the coverage from the AP in the hallway, if I hover my mouse over here, we take a look at the coverage from the access point here is minus 73 dBm, which isn't necessarily a very good signal strength for Wi-Fi. But let's take a look at what happens when we move the AP from the hallway into the room instead. And what you see now is by placing the AP in the room where the users are going to be, they're going to have much better coverage in the room and that's going to be where they're going to be using it. One of the things that I wanted to show you as well, if we go back to putting this access point in the hallway, if we are thinking about roaming for our Wi-Fi clients, now typically if your Wi-Fi client device has got a good signal strength, it's not going to think about going to find another access point to go and associate to and, and move to because it's got a good signal strength. Typically what happens with most devices, as you start to transition and move away from one access point and the signal starts to degrade it goes and okay, the device goes okay my signal is now getting to the threshold where i want to go and find another access point to go and associate to let me go and see if there's any other access points with this sid for me to join but if your signal strength is very good for the client device for the access point it's connected to it's not even going to think about doing that so let's just zoom in here and look at what happens to the Wi-Fi as we walk down this corridor. And we walk down here and we can see if I hover my mouse just on this point of the floor plan, we've got a signal strength of minus 58 dBm. But now let's pretend that we're connected on this mobile device associated to that access point, connected at neg 58 dBm, and we take a half a meter step to the left-hand side as we're walking down this corridor and we take a look at the signal strength now. We go from minus 58 dBm all the way down to minus 83 dBm, which is a really, really bad signal strength in Wi-Fi. So what's happened to your mobile device whilst you were connected to this Wi-Fi call? The most likely thing is that you've probably been disconnected, the call starts get choppy. Uh, why is that? That's because your device has gone from having a great signal strength where it didn't even think about, I need to go and roam to another access point, so all of a sudden, the Wi-Fi signal has just completely fallen off a cliff and it needs to go and find panic scan another access point to go and associate to. So that's another reason why we don't place APs in the hallways. So if I go back to putting this access point in the, the room, and we can see we've got the good coverage in the rooms now, this is a flagship AP. 
And if we are placing access points inside of the rooms, we might not necessarily want to be placing flagship APs uh, in on the ceiling because there's not going to be that many users in the room. So actually, we might want to use a different type of access point. Has anyone that's on the webinar today heard of these different type of access points that are referred to as like the hospitality APs? Have you seen them? They look a little bit. Jeremy was faster than you, Matt. <laughs> ah, said. Good, good on Jeremy. So if anyone that's on the webinar that hasn't heard of a hospitality AP or wondering what this is um, and why is this different to like a typical flagship AP you'd put on the ceiling, well, these APs, they're designed to be installed in the rooms and they have got ports on the back. So you take where the wall jack is, where the Ethernet cable goes in and you stick this access point on the wall instead. And you have got some ports on the bottom to physically connect any devices in the room that are not going to be moving around, such as TVs or gaming consoles, you can still cable those in if you need to. But typically, what height would you say, Mac or Stu, is the uh, Ethernet ports in rooms normally? Uh, normally, um, in, the, in the old days, it's going to be down at the receptacle level is usually. But now we're seeing a change in that in building constructions. So when hotels and hospitality are even dorms are getting uh, renovated. All those are actually moving up to the desk height of 36 inches now. So they're actually just coming above, I think maybe 40 inches, just above the counter, or counter type height is what we call it. So it's gonna be just above the countertop uh, by about, um, I think six to eight inches. Someone will probably correct me on the- So, on so, but so yeah, roughly just, around- Just above the countertop, yeah. So- Okay, so perfect. So yeah, roughly around- you see a, Yeah, I feel <laughs> like you see a receptacle on the countertop today. That's roughly where the ethernet ports are now be coming up on, even in the desks and hotel rooms, yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much, Stu. So what Stu said was basically means it's going to be roughly around 0.5 meter height for everyone else that works in the metric system like me. But we just learned previously on the last demo that uh, when we place access points by default, they get, they get placed at the 2.4 meter height. So what I want to show you <clears throat> is using this hospitality AP and actually mounting it rather than being on the ceiling at 2.4 meters, I want to show you how you mount it on the wall, the orientation and changing the height. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete this access point and I'm going to turn off the view of the walls now. They're still going to be there in the background and attenuating our signal from our access point, but we're just not going to see them. So I can show you on the map um, a little bit easier. So I'm going to grab that AP12, which is that hospitality access point. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to place my first one down here on the left-hand side. And what you see straight away now, you see we've got these little arrows. This is the direction that the... Um, AP is facing. So what I want to do now is pop out this view. And then what we can see, we've got the AP12. I want to go to edit the access point and look at what we've got here now. The AP12 automatically Echo Hell knew this type of AP and it changed the mounting orientation from being on the ceiling to being on the wall, which is pretty cool. Knows it automatically and does it for you. So the only thing that I want to change now is the height. So I want to change it from 2.4 meters to 0.5. And another thing that I would like to show you, actually, that I think Echo does really, really well is changing the name. So I like to name my access points when I'm doing my predictive designs inside of Echo. One for the implementation installation team, and then two for the support team. So what I like to do is give it a site identifier. I'm going to go with LON for London. And then I want to show what height, the um, what floor we're on. And I saw this was on floor six. So I'm going to do level six and then doing one more hyphen and then AP01, okay? So I'm happy now, the AP is mounted to the wall, it's at 0.5 meter height and I've changed the name. Perfect, close. We can see now that this has got the name I just gave it and I'm gonna just close this view and I'm gonna change the orientation of the antenna to say that this AP is installed against the wall over here. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to copy and paste. But watch what happens when I've pasted. It's incremented the host name of the access point. So it automatically increments the name of the AP for you. So we can see we've got AP1, AP2, and I'm going to keep copying and pasting. And there we see it's incrementing the names of our host names for our access points. And what I can do now is copy and paste. And as I'm placing my access points in the dorm rooms, we can see that we are meeting 
our requirements and it's at the height that we set as well as changing the name for us. Pretty cool. If I show you this view now, you can see that they've all saved the height at 0.5 meters. And what I can simply do now is just carry on copying and pasting my access points. And let's say this time now, I, don't, I want it to be mounted against this wall over here. I can change the orientation and but actually, let me put it in this direction and mount it against this wall here. Now I change it, I copy and I paste, and I can keep on placing my access points, doing my design using the in-room purpose-built APs for this type of environment. And another cool thing that I want to show you is actually, let's say, you know, we look at the APs in this, these rooms over here, and I'm happy with my design. And I can see I've got a very similar layout over here uh, on this part of the floor plan. What I can do actually is I could grab all of these access points at the same time, copy them all, and then paste, and then move them over to here as well. And then I've got the same design matching on the other side. So this is just one way that we could go around doing our uh, primary coverage planning for these rooms. But Mac, I know you had a point that you wanted to talk about uh, for the university dorm rooms that we uh, sometimes don't necessarily need to worry about so much. And what was that, Mac? Sure. So some of you might wonder, do we place access points in every room, every second room or every third room? And the answer, as always, is that it depends. So if you have low attenuation of walls between the rooms, then probably you will be able to place an AP in every third room. So you will always be covering through one wall and it's fine. But last dorms that I was designing for and surveying, they had concrete walls between all the rooms with around 10 to 12 dB of attenuation. So very heavy. In this case, we had to place the AP in every single room. Also the APs were under the desk so when students, they sit at their desks, they will be attenuating as well. So it, it honestly depends. Matt is doing like every second room, which is fine, but measure your attenuation and understand your building well before you start placing your APs and doing the design. Yeah. And the other thing that we wanted to talk about, Mac, was around secondary coverage. If I go to the secondary coverage view now, oh no, what we can see here is that there's quite a few places that we're not meeting our secondary coverage requirements, but Mac, is that as much of an issue in this type of environment? So in dorm environments, you don't need to really roam fast when you are on the corridor, walking down the corridor to the kitchen from your room. Where you want to have great Wi-Fi is in your bed and at your desk. Typically, your bed is on the same side of the room as the shower is, that is attenuating signal of the APs placed in the corridors, and your desk will be against the window. So before the signal reaches there, when you have a piece mounted in corridors, it will be very, very bad. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to stop sharing now because Mac's got a really exciting type of environment that he's going to show you how you can do your coverage planning for now. So uh, over to you, Mac. Okie doke. Okie doke. So I'm loading up my project, got my Echo How share screen and sharing my Echo How so hopefully you can see a beautiful design, well, beautiful warehouse layout. It's not a design yet. So now I have everything turned on. We can see some walls. We can see different coverage areas for different areas of the warehouse. We have office coverage area here. And if I go to edit this area, we can see that the office coverage area is just five gigs, next 67 primary, next 67 secondary. Uh, 25 dB SNR, stuff like that. So we want to have a little bit better quality of Wi-Fi in the office space. And then the warehouse and outdoors coverage area, uh, they both have the same requirements called warehouse and outdoor area. And there we want to design for NEG 70, just primary, no secondary signal requirements. Before you start doing your design, it's extremely important for you to understand if you really need to have redundancy or 
better roaming capabilities inside the aisles? How long are the aisles? Are you fine covering it with just one AP or do you need to have two APs uh, shooting from each side or can you cover it with an access point shooting from one side in a zigzag manner or can you use the warehouse AP that you place around the middle of the aisle and then light up on both sides? So you need to be 100% sure what are the requirements. All right. So we have our requirements. We know what coverage we are designing for. Let's start placing some APs, maybe starting with the office. But before I do that, I will disable areas. And now it's clearer for me to start placing the APs. For this demo, I will be using uh, Cisco APs. So I will be using 9120 access points. So flagship Wi-Fi performance from Cisco. Let me delete the generic AP uh, rule of thumb. Never use generic APs for your designs because they don't exist. Always design with the access points that you are planning to use in your real environments. And this AP is placed at 2.4 meters height, a typical normal power level. So let me change power levels from milliwatts to a DBM quickly because I have a nice talking point about that. Save that and going back to my office. I've placed one AP, that's fine. I will copy and paste that somewhere else. So I can see that this area is not too well covered yet. So I will place an AP there because why not? And this area as well, close to the users, close to the desk, close to the coffee tables. So now my signal strength and my secondary signal strength in the office will be very good. That's an office. Easy peasy lemon squeezy, right? We are all familiar with internal omnis. Now let's discuss the warehouse racks. So these racks here, they are very heavy attenuators. 18 dBs per meter is very high. It's higher than typical what we see in the warehouse. Like if you have bottles of water or beer or wine, you will see something like that. If you have, you know, a paper or something lightweight that doesn't attenuate Wi-Fi signal too much, then it will be lower. But for this example, let's use uh, let's use uh, this attenuation, high attenuation of 18 dB per meter. I will be using higher gain directional antennas here from Cisco also. It's 2513. 2513, it's 13 dBi gain antenna. And I will use it with 9120 AP with external antenna slot. Okay, do you want to replace? No, I don't want to replace. I want to place a new one, please. So I have it here. And let me place the access point. Let's say I will start on the left-hand side. I will assume that this AP can be mounted here on a cable tray, for example, if I can click correctly and accurately. You can see that if it's pointing up, it doesn't cover aisle too well, right? So we want to point the antenna where we want to have coverage. So when I do it like that now, entire aisle, that is quite long. The aisle is 63 meters long. I can hey, easily light it up. What's up? Can you show everyone the, uh, the also the coverage planning awesome tool that we've got? Because it shows it really nicely with this type of antenna. Of course I can. So if I go to signal strength coverage planning, you will be able to, before placing the access point, like look at that, when I click on the AP and I want to put it somewhere, it shows me the predicted coverage based on, on the placement of the access point. Can you so see that? Cool. So now antenna is pointing to the same direction as the last IP. So now it's pointing to the right hand side. When I move it to here, now I'm using back lobe from the coverage pattern from the antenna to light up the aisle, which is probably not what we want to, to have. So I will drop another access point here and I will go back to my uh, primary signal strength. Now two aisles are quite nicely lit. Uh, but before I continue, let's assume that for cliff, they can go to like five meters high. What's up, Stu? You're going to have to, uh, to um, uh, take a look at the height there. We're getting a few call outs there in the Q&A. So uh, what about the height? Yeah, so that, I'm yeah. about to cover that. Okay, so perfect. So let's say that the, uh, that the forklifts are going to six meter height and the warehouse is eight meters high and our access points will be ideally placed higher than the reach of your forklift. So let's say that for this example, I want to do uh, seven meters. Seven meters feels fine. Now look what happens with the coverage when I place the IP seven meters above the ground. Now it's higher up. So inside the aisle, you will see slightly less coverage from that particular access point. Let's look at it again. I put it to seven meters high and 
come on, come on. Okay, and it's a little bit lower than it was before. So what I'm going to do now, I will edit my multiple selected access points, and I will tell Ekahau to tilt them down a little bit, maybe 15 degrees, not the massive tilt, but with one AP per aisle, that should be more than enough. It will be better for the coverage. So I'm doing just that. Seven meters, default power levels. And now when it comes to power levels, the interesting thing is, if I go to editing one AP, look at that. You have in the bracket EIRP, that's the resonated power from that radio chain, from that radio plus antenna. So if I have 8 dBm transmitting power level and I have 13 dBi high-ish gain antenna, it results in higher IRP. So as, as Wi-Fi professionals, we need to ensure that we are not exceeding regulatory domain limits there. So just like quick talking point there. Okay, so I have placed two of these APs there. Let me copy that access point and place it on the other side and rotate that antenna. Ta-da, magic, and copy and paste it here. And now with these four APs, our primary coverage here is spotless, amazing, beautiful, sexy. So I wouldn't change a thing here. Now let's talk about the pallets. So look at that, guys. From the antennas here, I am using back lobes and side lobes to cover the area behind the APs as well. And it's absolutely fine to do it. So you can leverage that instead of placing additional APs there. Okay, so let's talk about pallets. Let me copy the omnidirectional internal AP from the office and place it here. Pallets are two and a half meters high and they have three dBs per meter attenuation. Let me show you the coverage for that selected AP. And it covers, yeah, it covers something quite a lot. I will put another omnidirectional AP here and I will select two of these omnidirectional APs. So could I cover my pallets with omnidirectional APs? Yes, I could, but is that the smartest way of doing it? Probably not. I can do it better. So remember the semi-directional antennas that we've mentioned before? We will use them very quickly now. So I happen to know that Cisco has 2566 antenna available. I will couple it with 9120 AP, so same radio, and I will start placing these APs. Let's say that I will place one access point, I don't know, somewhere here, and let's see what happens. Now I will highlight that access point, and okay, it covers quite a lot in front of the AP, not behind. Do you know why? Because it's pointing to the front of the antenna. And Ekehau assumes, by default, that this patch antenna is mounted against the wall. We want to mount it against the ceiling, suspend it down, create cone of coverage. So let me put like six meters here as well for that particular antenna. And now look at that. This covers so beautifully this area around this pallet that I won't be able to sleep from all the excitement now. It's so great. When I just use two of these APs and highlight both of them, now it's absolutely smashing. It's absolutely smashing. So when I go for signal strength shown for my APs, the warehouse has a perfect coverage with just how many? Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 antennas. That includes the secondary coverage in the office. Great stuff. Now we have the last requirements outside. And outside, we will place the AP, the easiest thing to do is to pick the access point with built-in external directional antenna. No cables, no mounting problems. So Cisco has 1562, D is a little bit more directional, I is 160 degrees beam width, so quite wide. And let's place it here. And now let's direct this arrow there. And look at that, ta-da, all requirements met. So that's everything that we wanted to talk about when it comes to the wireless design in a basic warehouse. Something you wanted to add, Matt? I just think it's so beautiful. Such a nice design, so easily done inside of Echohau. Look at all of oh, that there you, we've got. Love. So many different types of access points and, and different types of antennas meeting the coverage for different parts of the building in different requirement ways. So it's really, really nice to see such a, a good design. I think we just have one or two more final slides, a few tips. And then we've got a little bit of a celebrity guest that's just that popped in as well that might want to say hello. So why don't we um, uh, show, the, we've got a little little bit of a tip for everyone as a takeaway. So how you can get the great coverage. Let me share. There we go. So three tips 
to get your Wi-Fi coverage right. First of all, going back to step one is gathering the requirements, making sure you understand exactly what devices you are designing the Wi-Fi for and how they're going to be using the Wi-Fi. The second tip is to use correct antennas for the job. Extremely important to pick the correct antenna, understand the coverage pattern, use side and back lobes because why not direct them, tilt them correctly. Yep. And then finally, making sure when you've completed your Wi-Fi design that you do the on-site validation part using your trusty sidekick to make sure your coverage requirements are being... Not you, the sidekick. Not sidekick. You, he, yeah, he is your favorite sidekick, of course, yes. but the actual you, sidekick. You, you, you've got to have the, the, the actual sidekick ready, right? That's what you exactly. do. Exactly. Yeah. Of course. So making sure you understand the limitations that you have around mounting of the access points and making sure you meet all of your requirements. So yeah, making sure you take out that guesswork, save time, use Echo to design your Wi-Fi networks, get it right first time. And that's pretty much all that we've got so far. So I wonder if our special guest wants to come on and say hello now. Well, hello. Are you referring to me, Matt? Of course, our celebrity special guest that's popped in to say hi to everyone. I don't know any celebrities or that I'm a special guest. Anyway, uh, great job for the uh, gazillions of folks who are still on the webinar. Um, while Stu would be totally happy to have you uh, to come along on any of your surveys, he doesn't scale. So the actual sidekicks, uh, <laughs> they work really well themselves. Yeah, well said. Very, oh, thanks for, uh, no, thank you for coming in and, and joining us, Jeff. Pleasure to have you here. First it looked great. Uh, all those, you know, things that are so exciting that we can't sleep. It's fantastic. And it it's seems like the, it seems like the audience agrees. <laughs> Hopefully. And guys, yeah. like, don't, don't leave yet. We appreciate that we are getting closer to the top of the hour, but I also appreciate that we have quite a lot of questions. So we will answer some of them online while still being live on a webinar. And then we will take some more questions because we have quite a lot. So guys, if you have any questions, upvote them and we will still answer them for you. There is no rush from our perspective. All right, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Stu, what was the, um, the uh, best question you saw in there that we uh, didn't get around to answering during the webinar? Uh, we, we, had, we had, a, I mean, well, the great thing actually about the webinar today was, was that a lot of the questions flowed right into the actual presentation in the demo. So as there was questions being asked about a certain aspect, how do you do the design? You were covering it. It was almost right on point. So um, I was trying to go in and go, yeah, we did. We answered that live, we answered <laughs> that live. So we did cover that. There's a lot of great questions that we're talking about when it comes back into design. And I mean, you covered it right in the beginning where is, you know, it's important to um, look into the requirements understand what you're dealing with in terms of walls. And one of the big ones that I did answer in there was, can we customize walls and make walls oh. in Ekahel? Right? That is, that, is a, that is a great question and great point, Stu. And you you absolutely can. So Ekahel pre-populates the typical default values that we see in the most common um, experiences, but you absolutely can create your own wall types with its own custom attenuation value. And you can modify the pre-built walls that come when you first fire up Echo House. So great question. Uh, whoever answered, uh, asked that, that's a really good point. And you absolutely can customize the, the wall types, the height of the walls, so if it comes up from the floor to a certain height, if it comes down from the ceiling from a certain height. I think they refer to it as a pony wall, uh, potentially. Uh, yeah, well, that would be the one from the bottom up. But yeah, so the other one, I can't remember is the, uh, what the term for that, that one. But yes, I do know what you're talking about. And that's a no. really good one because that is common in retail. Um, oh, yeah. You have a, um, and you can also use it in a warehouse, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Think and, about you know, a warehouse, you got an aisle, but you have a pathway for forklifts to go under. So if you yes. know that already is about, um, you know, like um, a few meters up, like three or four meters up, and you know that you can actually create a, a special wall in that area of the warehouse to say, okay, you're coming from, you're going to be 15 feet from the floor, but I know the ceiling height of the building is already 30. So we're okay. We can we can measure that, and it's really cool how you can actually visualize the antenna pattern going through, and how mm -hmm. Mac was actually putting his antenna as he's doing his down tilt. Uh, that antenna is going to start broadcasting into the other aisle. Now, not that you would you do want to have coverage in there, but there are just um, ways to visualize it to help you. Stu, you lost me at feet. I know. Sorry. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Same. Okay, guys, let's try to answer a few more questions. Uh, upvoted question number one is when we measure attenuation values on site, should we measure in 2.4, 5, or 6 gigs? And the answer is the difference will be negligible, so use whatever radio you have. If you have AP on a stick with 5 gigs on, in, then do it. Stu, don't worry about your focus. It's, yeah, I know. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, it, it comes and goes. <laughs> <laughs> so really, guys, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, just make sure to be consistent when measuring attenuation of all the walls using the same uh, the same frequency. Uh, uh, question about the, the art. Yeah, go on. Yeah, no, sorry, go ahead. I, think, I, 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 think I, know what, I know which one you're asking, so go ahead. Yeah. Okay, it's a question yeah. about the RTLS. Uh, for locating RTLS applications, you could need to have a tertiary coverage. And yes, that is correct, assuming that you are using RTLS uh, based on RSSI, so distance-based, using Wi-Fi. You probably wouldn't be using Wi-Fi too much for the accurate RTLS uh, these days. Uh, also, I know that we've had quite a lot of questions about device offsets and mobile views. So this mm -hmm. is the answer that will take around five minutes. So I'm not sure if you want to, to go there. I would oh. love to have you guys. Yeah. Well, the other thing, the other thing that we need to mention is that we were purely focused on, you know, coverage for this one. But our next webinar, our next webinar that we're doing, we might be covering it that in a little bit more detail. So around device, different types of devices, device profiles, offsets, we will 100% be covering that in great detail on our next webinar. So make sure okay. you sign up and stay tuned if you want to find out more about capacity planning, device offsets, different types of devices, because we're going to cover that in great detail on our next webinar. Can't wait already. We have mm -hmm. a beautiful live demo for the offsets that shows how to do it properly, including a mobile view button, do's and don'ts, and gotchas. Yep. Cool. Yep, okay. sure. In this case, I think that's everything for now. Okay. Well, I just want to thank each and every one of you for joining us on this webinar today. I personally loved it. It was great having you with us to go through and show you some of the, uh, you know, really cool features inside of Echo Help Pro. I uh, hope you enjoyed the webinar. Please make sure you sign up for that one. We've got ne the next one and the few ones after that, we're covering a series of webinars taking you through how you can really design high performing wireless networks and each of the important criteria we couldn't cover them all today so we're going focused on each one that each of the important criteria so make sure you stay tuned you sign up for the next upcoming webinars and we're going to be covering it all so thank you everyone for joining us max Stu, the wider echo marketing team and also jeff for popping in and seeing us <laughs>